Psalm 63. Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you, and my whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. Has anyone experienced that today? Are you walking through that? Have you ever been there where there's a dry and weary land, there's no water? Your body longs for the Lord. This is verse 2. It says, I've seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Because your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. Because you satisfy me more than the richest feast. I praise you with the songs of joy. I lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night. Because you, God, are my helper. I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. And I cling to you. Your strong right hand holds me secure. I'm not sure where you are today, but Jesus is a constant. Jesus is always faithful and he's always good and he's our only hope in this life. No matter what we're facing, what we go through each week and day and moment, he's something that'll never fail. And so as we sing this next song, just set your eyes on him. Don't, don't put your eyes and your mind and your heart back on that thing that keeps pulling you away and distracting you. Just right now, just look to Jesus. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, oh, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of power of Christ in me, from life's first cry to final breath, oh, Jesus commands my destiny, no power of hell, no scheme 
of man could ever pluck me from his hands till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. I find my strength. I find my strength. I find my hope. I find my help in Christ alone. When fear is when darkness falls, I find my peace in Christ alone. I give my life, I give my all. I sing this song to Christ alone. The King of kings, the Lord of all. Oh, heaven sings to Christ alone. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I'll stay. Here in the power of Christ we stand. Amen. We stand in the power of Christ today. Amen. Jesus, today we just look to you, we honor you, and we worship you in this place. And now as we open your word, God, I just pray that these words we've sung will become real. God, I pray that we would, we would not just sing them or speak these words, God, or just come to this gathering and, and sit, but God, that we would come and interact with you, realizing that you are a real God. You're here. Your Holy Spirit is now available in Jesus to us. We have hope no matter the circumstance, God. So God, we just give you honor and praise in this place, in this very moment. And it's in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You can have a seat. Our children are making their way to Children's Church. And hopefully you are taking your Bible and open it to the 37th Psalm. Starting last week and for the next several weeks, we're going to be doing like a little mini break from the book of Mark. And we're going to do a little why series. And uh, today the why is why time matters. You know, why is that big word that a lot of people ask? And they ask it a lot. Um, I heard something this week. It says, why is it that when you order a round pizza that it comes in a square box? You ever thought about that? Why is it? Why is it that when you get a loaf of bread, the bread is square and oftentimes the lunch meat is round? Why is it that people say that money don't grow on trees, but when you get ready to deposit money... You go to a bank branch to put it in. I mean, isn't it just why? There's no end to why. But yet when you come to, to this whole idea of the 37th Psalm today, we're going to deal with something that I think that, that if we're not careful, we'll let it get by way too quick. We're going to deal with this thing called time. Because every one of us, only have so much time in any given day. That's just the way it is. You know, I, I was sitting there uh, on the front pew uh, this morning thinking that, that I have managed in my lifetime to live 62 years, one month, and 30 days. Well, if you crunch them down to the days, that's 22,704 days. And, and that's how long I've been on this planet, since uh, 256 on a Thursday of February the 26th of 1959 in Samaritan Hospital in Moses Lake, Washington. When I was born, I, I managed to carve out that many days. 
Now, there's no guarantee that I'm going to have that, that 705th day or that 22nd thousand uh, 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 days. Uh, 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 what I do have is today. And that's what we have is today. In fact, what we have today is right now, this moment of this day. So as we think about this time and ultimately this time that, that matters and it should matter, it should matter to God because the Bible says that this is the day that the Lord hath made. The Bible says that. When the Bible speaks, it speaks about days. It doesn't say this is the decade that the Lord hath made or this is the century that the Lord hath made. It says this is the day that the Lord hath made. When the psalmist was writing in Psalms 90, he says, Lord, teach me to number my days. Why does he do that? Because he wants us to live our life understanding that we only have a certain allotment of days. Not everybody has the same amount of days. But everybody has the same amount of hours in, the, in, in everybody else's day is the same, 24 hours in a day. So today we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that's found in, the, uh, in Psalms 37. And I'm going to begin reading actually in verse number 1. And as I begin to read, I want you to do me a favor. I know you've been standing, and if you want to, if you can't, I understand. But if you'll stand as we read the Word of God. Beginning in verse number 1, and I'm going to read it from the New King James Version. It says, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on His faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him, and do not fret because of Him who prospers in His way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger, forsake wrath, and do not fret, for it only causes Harm. You may be seated. What the psalmist does right here, that he is reminding us of something. He's reminding us that, that we may not get to see the full outcome of a person's life, but God keeps a perfect record. I mean, God gets, keeps a perfect record. The very first psalm describes that. talks about the blessed life. In the light that is planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in its season. That God honors a life well lived. And then in the very first psalm, he said the wicked are not so. They're just like the chaff that the, that, that the wind blows away. They look prosperous now, but in the end, they're just like chaff. They're just blown away in the wind. They're just dust in the wind. But yet God keeps up with that. God keeps up with it. In fact, Solomon, when he wrote the last little verse of, of Ecclesiastes, says, this is the whole duty of man. Fear God and keep His commandments. For every deed, be it good or evil, will be brought before God. And we have to give an account of that. Why do you think that God is so intentional when He talks about time? Because God don't want any of us to waste it. God don't want us to waste our time. That's what the, that 37th Psalm is about. It's not being preoccupied with the way of the world, but be preoccupied with the way of God. And so therefore, you won't waste your time if you're preoccupied with God. But you will waste your time if you are preoccupied with the person in the cul-de-sac, or if you're preoccupied with the person that you read about on Glamour magazine, or, or you watch on TV. If you're trying to keep up with anything, Kardashian or what, you will waste your life. But if you try to follow after God, you will live a full life. That's what he tells us. A.W. Tozer made this statement once in, in his book, Pursuit of God. 
A.W. Tozer says, time is a resource that is non-renewable and non-transferable. You cannot store it. You cannot slow it up. You cannot hold it up. You cannot divide it up or give it up. You can't hoard it up or save it for a rainy day. When it's lost, it's unrecoverable. When you kill time, remember that it has no resurrection. There's no resurrection to kill time. It don't come back. When I became a Christ follower in my 20s, I remember one of the very first thing that I wanted to do as a Christ follower. I wanted to make up for lost time. That's the dumbest thing I think I said as a young Christian. You cannot make up time. You cannot make up for lost time. Because once lost, uh, time is lost, it is lost. But what, what you can do is, like Tozer said, is learn how to live now. Right now. There are 168 hours in a seven-day week. Now, we've already managed to squeeze out about 10 hours and 35 minutes of this week. But if you were to crunch down the hours, they say on average we sleep uh, uh, about 56 hours. 24 of that 168 is spent eating or self-grooming or personal hygiene. I know some of you fudge on that. And then there's about 50 hours is called a work week. I mean, that's getting ready. That's getting in the car. That's driving. That's getting there. And that's even very liberally saying I'm going to work 40 hours while I'm getting paid for 40 hours. So therefore, when you get it all down, at the end of it all, there are about 38 hours left in a week that are what you call discretionary. Do you know what discretionary hours are? You get to do with those hours whatever you want to do with them. Now, if you are Justin and Leslie, you know where all their discretionary time goes. If you're a young parent, you understand that. If you are a parent of teenagers, you know that your work week has been carved, half of that's been carved out for worrying about these delinquent teenagers that you brought into this world. You know how that works, right? So discretionary is really subjective. The fact is, is that we all have time every week that we choose to do with it what we want to do with it. If we want to do something productive, if we want to make a difference, if we want to love somebody, if we want to take time to tell somebody we love them and tell them in the best way possible by spending time with them, then we have that discretionary ability to do it. But can I tell you something? One of the things that I have learned in these 62 years, one month and 30 days, is that a lot of people come to the end of their life and the one thing they wish that they could do all over again is the very thing they should have paid attention to before they wish they had to do it all over again. That's spend time with their family. That's to spend time with somebody you love. That's to walk with them and talk with them and not be hurried in the conversation. Isn't that, isn't that true? So therefore, if it is, and it is true, then there are some things that we can do to help us to be able to carefully spend our time in a way that would please God. In your worship bulletin, there, there are four little truths that I want us to zero in on today. First of all, Time matters to God because of this. Fellowship matters to God. God is intent on intimacy with his children. God wants intimacy with his kids. In fact, you see that right there in that passage of Scripture. says, delight yourself also in the Lord. That word delight is a beautiful word. It literally means to take pleasure in him. Delight yourself in the Lord. Take pleasure in God. Make God an object of your great pleasure of your life. Take pleasure in spending time with God. You know, if, if you don't take pleasure in that, then that pleasure that you ro are robbed from in spending time with God, you will take it and you will invest it in things that really are good things, but they're not the most important thing. 
Because you think about all the pleasure things that we have in this life. You know, I've been married for 40 years, and all of them have been pleasurable. No, we did have three days and nights of camping all alone at Tannehill this, this weekend, and, which is weird because we never camped alone but one time, and then we had a child, and then, we, uh, and then all that happened after that. So we'll have another baby shower lately, but, uh, later, but uh, <laughs> pleasure, pleasure. Think about pleasure. Don't tell me there's no pleasure in being married. But don't tell me that the sole purpose of pleasure in life is marriage because I will prove to disagree with that. Because apart from Jesus Christ, there's no pleasure. You can have marriage for 40 years or 60 years or 80 years. Is that really where the pleasure comes from? If pleasure was so marriage-driven, why are more and more people not wanting to get married or even stay married? Don't tell me. Don't tell me that, that children, boy, that's where the pleasure comes from. Now, I, they don't know it yet, and don't tell them. But, but Lulu is a... Is a Absolutely, is an angel right now. She got, she got wings. She flies around that little old house on Third Avenue where they live. That night, she's just flying around like a little angel wings. But I'm going to tell you, there will come a time and puberty will hit and she will grow a tail that will stick all the way out in the road. And there will be horns. There will be horns everywhere. She can't even walk through the door with horns on. Now, I know it's probably not going to happen to them, but it happened to me. So if that is the case, my whole existence in life was procreating and having many me's walking around our house. If that was the case, then I would be one foolish person. Because as much pleasure as there is in marriage and as much pleasure there is in being a parent or a grandparent, that is not where the pleasure comes from. In fact, the psalmist says, delight yourself in the Lord. Delight yourself in Him. Understand that, that the most important thing in your life, the most important thing in your life, as a Christian, we understand the most important thing in our life is fellowship with God. Spending time alone with God. Understanding what it means to be alone with God. Understanding that fellowship with others, while that is important, community, we don't fellowship in this room. Look at that naughty head in front of you. I mean, not, not me. <laughs> Can you fellowship with the back of a head? Is there anything personal and intimate and cozy about the back of the head that's in front of you? Now, we come here to focus on God. We do community to focus on one another and to help each other. That's the beauty of fellowship. We fellowship with God. We fellowship with others. We just don't go do church. We become church. That's important, isn't it? That's imperative, actually, in that passage. It says, delight yourself also in the Lord. And then he takes it to the second phase of that, and he says, that this whole thing about time that matters to God, it matters because contentment matters. Contentment. This is what he says. And he shall give you the desires of your heart. In other words, that when you delight yourself in the Lord, and you're delighted in him, and then he gives you the desires of your heart. Man, that's a beautiful thought. When we delight in the Lord, our desires will become His desires. Isn't it amazing when you fall in love with Jesus, you start loving what Jesus loves? Even if, even if it's, it is a spouse that for whatever reason you're not communicating with, even if it's a child that there's no communication that you once had with that child anymore, it's amazing. Isn't it amazing that in the midst of all of that, there can be enormous contentment? 
Because your contentment didn't come from a spouse. It didn't come from a house. It didn't even come from a kid. Your contentment came from Jesus. And he gives us the contentment to be able to deal with even the things that are hard to deal with. And that's what he tells us. He gives us this image right there. He said, delight yourself in the Lord. And guess what happens? He will give you the desires of your heart. Someone said that in our life, there are all kinds of desires. There's selfish desires. You know, I want what I want when I want it. I mean, that's what three and four-year-olds do. And then they kind of get on up there to middle age and sing your adult life. I want what I want when I want it. That's selfish. And there's just these old satanic desires. The devilish desires. I, I heard a humorous story about a woman that came home from a shopping spree. And her husband had no idea she had gone out shopping. She walked in just grinning from ear to ear. And she had a beautiful little uh, carrying thing with a dress hidden behind the, uh, the cover. And he said, what is that? And she said, you're not going to believe it. It is a $1,000 dress that I got for $500. And she said, I'm broke now. I don't have a penny to my name. You're not going to believe it. Yeah, I can't believe I did it now. After I drove with it home, I can't believe I did it. And she said, her husband looked at her and said, why did you let the devil talk you into that? And she said, well, he put it on display. And I had a, had a place in the fitting room to try it on. And I put it on and I walked down and looked at myself in the mirror with it on. And she said, he said to her, why didn't you just say, get behind me, Satan? And she said, I did. I said, get behind me, Satan. And then all of a sudden, Satan said, it sure looks good from back here too. <laughs> and I couldn't help it. Selfish, satanic. And what about just that sanctified desires? What is a sanctified desire? Is that God, whatever I'm going to do with this life, whatever I'm going to do with this day today, God, I don't want to do anything that's going to make you embarrassed. I don't want to embarrass you by my words of my mouth, the conduct of my life. I don't want to embarrass you by the way that my spending trends are or my habits. God, I don't want to do it. I want to have a desire that's sanctified. I want you to get glory for it. I want to give it over to you. God wants the best for our life. And the best for our life is when we do things that bring Him glory. Most every Christian, if you're 30 or below, have a book by John Piper. You know, Desiring God, all those things that Piper did at Bethlehem Baptist and speaking at uh, uh, Louis Giglio conferences, uh, one-day conferences and things like that. John Piper has this phenomenal statement. says, God is most glorified in me when I'm most satisfied in Him. I'm going to tell you, this has taken a whole new wrinkle with John Piper here lately. He has a kid named Abraham. Now, I say a kid. He's a 40-year-old man. And he is becoming independently wealthy on this thing called TikTok. And what he does on TikTok, he refutes everything Christianity says. He refutes everything that his daddy told him, that Noel, his mother, told him. He goes on there in a little minute and a half, little vignettes, and he's walking vulgar mouth, filthy mouth, brilliant mind, obviously. But he is destroying everything. And people are applauding it from the woodwork. Why? Because you can get a following if you attack the status quo of Christianity. He's doing it. And John Piper would say, God is most glorified in me when I am most satisfied in Him. He's not satisfied with his boy Abraham. But his satisfaction has to come from God. And dear friend, it has to come from God. He is the one that ultimately 
gives us the sacrifice that we need. Time matters to God because fruitfulness matters to God. Listen to what he said. Commit your way to the Lord and trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. And he uses that word there that commit and it's the word that literally means to, to roll over. It, it means to like take the burden off of your shoulder and roll it onto God. In other words, say no longer to worry. Give your worry to God. Give the things in your life that, that own you, that keep you awake at night. Give it to God. Develop an attitude of gratitude that says, God, I'm giving over this worry to you. I am letting you have it. I am not going to be controlled any longer by it. See, every one of us, if we're not careful, we get robbed of a lot of our days by worry. I love what Mark Twain said. He said, I, I used to worry about a lot, a lot of things, and some of them happened. Mark Twain said, I worried about things that never did, didn't even happen. And what did worry do for me? It robbed me. What does worry do to you? It robs you. Instead of trusting God, you're trusting yourself. Put your confidence in God. Do as the scripture tells us. Remind ourselves that, that commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it all to pass. Even a year from now or 10 years from now, or if God lets you have 20 years, the thing you worry about won't even matter. It won't matter. But what will matter is what you did with that day that you worried. So give it to God. Time matters because freedom matters. He tells us right there in that passage, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him and do not fret. You see that verse, that word fret in verse 1 and verse, verse 7 and verse 8 and it keeps on going throughout the chapter. But that whole idea of fret means to burn. I mean, to get angst, to get angry or to be overwhelmed by looking at the world and everything. The world is prospering around us and people that are doing evil things are getting, getting obviously benefiting from doing evil things. And then he said, don't fret. Don't fret over the world. Don't burn over the affairs of the world. Don't do it. Have freedom in your life. Let freedom take your life and rule in your life. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of Him who prospers in His way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Do not fret. And the way we keep from fretting, instead of just being concerned about the world is learn what it means to spend time alone with God. How do you know God better? By spending time with God. How do you understand what God would desire for your life? By spending time with God. How do you know how to communicate with someone else about the love of God? By spending time with God. How do we know Him and trust Him and love Him? By spending time with God. So time matters. It does matter. I mean, totally D, you've done a lot of things with your life. You managed to graduate school or college or you managed to land that job. But what have you forfeited along the way? Listen, 62 years, one month and 30 days. I've seen a lot of young people graduate church. Graduate. They didn't wait till they graduated high school. They graduated sometimes in the fifth grade, sixth grade. They may make it all the way to the seventh grade. Oh, they're sitting on the premises. They're sitting here. Mom and dad... You're going to pull the Piper card on them. You're going to go to church. But they're sitting here 
And they're a million miles away at the same time. And I'm telling you, you can graduate a lot of things in this life and get a great diploma for it. But if you graduate on God, you will be disappointed. You will hang your head in shame. And you will realize, hey, I had all the time that everybody else did and I chose to do what with mine what I wanted and I squandered it. You can't make up for lost time. You can't buy it back. But what you can do is right now. Commit your way unto the Lord. Commit it as unto Him. Someone has said that that when you think about time, time alone with God, when you experience that not time alone with God, there, there are three benefits that comes with that. First of all, you're never, ever going to be alone. Never. You're never alone. You can live your life knowing that God hears you. Even when your prayers don't get above the ceiling, you know God comes below them. God doesn't have a limit to how far he can go low. He can go all the way down to the bottom of the bottom where you are. God hears your prayers. You can spend your life knowing that God is, will not leave you. He will hear your prayer. And he will walk with you. That 23rd Psalm, the heart of it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I for fear no evil, for thou art with me. I will walk through. That word, prep, that little preposition through. I will walk through this valley. I will get through this dark time. I will get through this difficult place in my life. I will get through this. But I will not have to get through this alone. Because the Lord, He's the one that's with me. I talked to my friend Sam this week. Actually, every day this week. It's just like the day before his conversation. He has severe Alzheimer's. He's, his wife Marie has Parkinson's and her life is close to the end. They're in their 90s in Melbourne, Florida. I was hanging up from the phone. I said, Sam, I'm praying with you tonight. Okay. Nobody ever prays with me. Just prayed with him the night before. I said, well, you know God's with you. I do. I prayed with him. And then he said, Billy, I need to tell you something. I only want to live one hour more than Marie. That's it. One hour. I don't want to live a day. I don't want to live a year. I don't want to live 10 years. I want my life when my sweet wife is gone and she needs me so much. I'm, I'm, I'm here only because of God and her. I want to live one hour more. Man. That comes from a life that even though he can't remember what he had for breakfast, he has yet to get over what God has done in his heart. See, that's why we delight ourselves in the Lord. That's why he will give us the desires of our heart. That's why there's freedom that comes in following Jesus. That's why when we walk up, wake up every day and we walk out that day, that day, we can live our life knowing that God has a vested interest in that day, in your life, in your life, in that day. You can live it. You can live the greatest life possible. And there are people that will stand in line for that kind of life if they just know that kind of life exists. That's why we live it. Because there are people that are not living it. And people need to see it work. And they can see it in you. Let's pray.
This week, if you manage to see it online, on the upcoming events for Sunday, I, I posted a thing about why time matters to God. And had four questions at the end. It says, are you drawing closer to God? Are you more content today than you were a year ago? Is there evidence in your life that God is at work in and through you? Does your walk with God free you from worry? Nobody can answer any of that for you but you. And I really don't even need to know what the answer is. But God would like to know. In fact, God already knows. God would like for you to know. So if you've not given your heart to Jesus, I can't think of a better day Give your heart to Jesus and right now. We don't have to invent ways. Just in your heart before God. Just say, God, I'm, I'm a sinner. What I do, I do willingly. I do it freely. I do it without any thought or forethought. I'm not concerned about what anybody says or what it does to affect anybody else. I'm doing it because I want to do it. I sin. Willingly and freely. And I need someone to be in charge of me. Because I can't fix me. I need you, God, to hear my prayer. And I cry out to you to forgive me of my sin. And this is what I do, God. I give you my life. It may not be much left. I can't make up time. But with the time I have left, I give it to you. Should that be your prayer today? Is that your prayer today? Father, thank you for giving us your word and keeping it. Lord, thank you for that. That beautiful 37th Psalm. Thank you, God, for reminding us that there is a heritage for those who walk righteous. And on the downside, God, remind us that there will be calamity for those who walk away and have no desire to walk with you. Lord, help us to trust you today with everything we have. In Jesus' name, amen. So we stand to our feet. If there is a need, you'd like to come and kneel at this altar. Listen, we, we've been a year or so without being able to kneel here because, you know, but I hope that you've been kneeling in a lot of other places. But if God's burden your heart about someone or something or today you're just ready to just take a step of faith and say I'm following Jesus everything I have lock, stock and barrel I'm giving it all to Jesus today you come
Oh, 